To read a work, must one also read the underlying infrastructure to make legible its aesthetic and political composition. This ability to read a phenomenon based on the infrastructures of resonance around it is what I refer to as seeing power. Nato Thompson. Hello, everyone. Thank you all for joining us tonight for the third talk of the Tehran Summit 01. My name is Afan Riyasi, and I'm, cura I'm the curator of the Tehran Summit. The summit creates an alternative way of looking at the process of art making and rejects the monopolization of art by the market. Taking, a, taking advantage of the internet and online platforms, the Tehran Summit creates a bridge between Iran's artistic atmosphere and other countries and brings together different contemporary discourses and methods of art making utilized by artists and art collectives. Tonight, we are hosting Nato Thompson. He is an author, a creator, and what he describes himself as cultural infrastructure builder. In 2021, he co-founded with Valley Rod and uh, Josh Goldblum, the NFT art commissioning organization, Artworld. Artworld takes the opportunities afforded by NFTs to craft and distribute historic artworks with the world's most visionary artists while also building an art world worth believing in. In 2020, NATO initiated and now directs the Alternative Art School, an online global art campus featuring faculties, faculties such as uh, Jenny Anthony, Trevor Paglen, Mark Dion, uh, Yale Bartano, and more. Previous to this uh, entrepreneur, to his entrepreneurial endeavors, Thompson worked as artistic director at Philadelphia Contemporary Creative Time as artistic director. <clears throat> and as creator of Mass at Mass Mocha, he has organized major creative time projects, including the Creative Time Summit 2009 to 2015, Pedro Reyes Democracy 2016, Cara Walker's Subtility 2014, Living as Form 2011, Jeremy Deller's uh, It Is What It Is 2009 with a new museum curators Laura Hop Hopman and Amy McKee. Democracy in America, the national campaign in 2008, and Paul Chan's Waiting for Godot in New Orleans in 2007, among others. He has written two books of cultural criticism, Seeing Power, Art as, and Activism in the 21st Century in 2015, and Culture as Weapon, The Art of Influence in Everyday Life in 2017. Thank you so much, Nato Thompson, for accepting our invitation, for uh, sharing your time with us. I must say that without NATO Thompson, there wouldn't be any Tehran Summit. And uh, it is uh, personally an amazing, uh, amazing thing that is happening right now. And uh, it's, an, it's such an honor, it's personally for me, to talk to you. And thank you so much for uh, sharing your time with us uh, tonight. The floor is yours, NATO. Well, all right, Irfan. Thank you so much. And thanks, all of you artists. Um, it's an honor to be here at the Tehran Summit in this online forum. I think it's totally, it is um, gonna be, for my lecture, I think the fact that it's happening at this summit is going to be the proving of the point itself. I'm increasingly in my life a big believer in not only supporting artists in every way possible, but also emotionally supporting each other. I think it's very difficult in this life to do things that aren't in the realm of the obvious. I think to do, to make other kinds of meanings, other kinds of social relationships, to dare to construct a world that isn't status quo or resist power is a very brave act. And the best way to be brave is that you have people that love you and support you while you're doing it. And so the fact that we're coming together while we're talking about art is in itself an extremely important point. And I wanna also admit, you know, I feel you humble to even be able to offer any thoughts to y'all. I know that you live in a very different situation than I do. And so I think it's, you know, I want to just say, I'm going to try to offer some thoughts I have with the qualification that, you know, I don't know what you're going through in many ways. And I don't know the difficulties you face. And I don't, I don't want to over exaggerate my ability to relate to your situation. So I, I guess I offer these thoughts humbly. And I really also appreciate the challenges that you're facing. I hope um, we can have an interesting conversation when I'm done. Um, this lecture is about infrastructure. And 
I want to say something really. So this is kind of like materialist self-help. And what I mean by that is <laughs> um, there was a group called the Situationists in Paris from 1968. And they really challenged this idea of, um, well, they challenged many things, but they were interested in this idea of the spectacle or the world that is produced by commodities that makes us a passive observer of the world around us. And furthermore, they really didn't like the idea of psychoanalysis only in so much as they felt that therapy without actually changing the world around it is a mistake. And that is to say, if you want to change what you think in your head, the way you change what's in your head is you reproduce the world around you. Now, that seems like a tall order, but rather than sitting there talking to a therapist, the best way to change who you are is to operate in a different world from what you operate in. And the reason I say that is because while I'm talking about infrastructure, and I'm going to talk about it really literally, like budgets, how to create alternative spaces, how to produce different methods of distribution, kind of the parts, particularly in the arts, that we kind of operate with, how we distribute our art, how we communicate the art, where our art goes to, this kind of stuff, I'll go into that. But I think the important lesson in this lecture is that we're doing this because we're also in doing this changing ourselves. And if you want to change an art scene, you have to change its infrastructure itself. And so even, just to say, the Tehran Summit is, an, is not just an opportunity for us all to get together. It's an opportunity for us to change how we collectively think of what's possible. And that we each are collectively changing our idea of what is possible with this thing called art or this thing called building a world. Make sense? But it is kind of like collective reprogramming. And the other part I'll say is I will go into um, this thing called legitimation. But the important part of this is, and just like the Tehran Summit, is I think it is really difficult in this life to make art because great art comes from great vulnerability. And vo being vulnerable in such a difficult, tough world is terrifying <laughs> which is to say it's scary being an artist speaking your personal truth is very hard and the greatest art often comes from those that speak the most personal truth but the problem is that the reason it's scary is because you do not get a lot of support that from that the world wants to close you down the more your truth doesn't jive with what's actually happening in the world, the more they think you're crazy, the more, you know, whether it's through, you know, your sexuality, your race, your system, your questioning power, your own personal truths will hit a wall. And the only thing, that the only way to make great art is not to just personally be, like just going for it no matter, some, pers some personality, some artists will do it no matter what, but most of us, could really benefit from supporting each other. And if we can support each other emotionally in our truths, the better art we will make. And so, you know, art's actually, unlike the mythology that it's something done alone, art is done by us supporting each other. It's actually a, the biggest team sport there is. Bigger than soccer, football, basketball, it is the biggest team sport. We actually need to support each other to make great art. So. This is the, the overall theme of what I want to talk about. And so for me, the Tehran Summit is not just an opportunity to hear ideas, but for us to look across the room and say, I got you. I support you. I'm thinking about you. All right. I know that's a little hippie or like <laughs> touchy feely, but as I get older, I think like it's something more worth mentioning. As an example, I say this to all my artists, your close friends, your close friends, you know how some people in the arts, your close friends are your biggest critics or your fellow activists are your biggest critics, go to those friends and tell them, I don't want our relationship to be this way. I think what I need from you is support. And I need us to build an environment of supporting each other. And I say that because the artist, art world can often be very attacking of each other but I think it's better to be supportive. I say that. So 
the, the, the smallest infrastructure I'll talk about is your friend and family group. It's actually an infrastructure. And rather than think it's something that just happens to you, think of that group, your family and friends, as your first infrastructure to change. Think of it as a form to shape intentionally. Think of it like this. You are who your friends are. If your friends don't reflect the world you want to operate in, then change it. You are as you are shaped by them and they shape you. So that's okay. I'll get into some. There's my therapy for a moment. But I'm telling you the backstory of this because it's I'm talking about art projects. Um, okay. Okay, can you see this? We good? We're fine, we good? Yes. Okay. Can you see me too, or is it just the screen? Uh, both of you. Okay, good, okay. Because I can't see anything, okay. So here's my lecture, cultural infrastructure. So I'm gonna start with a project I worked on in 2007. Um, it's a project by the artist Paul Chan. It took place in New Orleans. I worked at a place called Creative Time where we did large scale public art projects, often politically, skewed in some way or trying to deal with uh, important topics. The situation here, this is um, in 2005, there was a massive hurricane in New Orleans called Hurricane Katrina, and the floods wiped out a particular part of New Orleans that was historically black and oppressed, and the community was completely wiped out. In 2007, I worked with the artist Paul Chan to restage a production of Samuel Beckett's Waiting for Godot in the area that was wiped out. In the United States, as you probably heard, issues around race are very uh, important, particularly considering the slave trade and slavery in America shaped its identity. And so conversations around black and white are hugely important, particularly in activist circles. And this was a project that was trying to deal with a black community's kind of situation um, through the use of theater. And I bring this project up because, um, well, I'll tell you why. We'll, I'll show you, we're gonna hear from Paul Cham, I'll show you a video so you get a sense of the project. The seed of the project comes from a simple question. If I were to stage an outdoor site specific production of Samuel Beckett's play, Waiting for Godot in the middle of the street to use the given landscape of New Orleans to tell the most emblematic story of waiting that we know, uh, then what else would you like to see happen? What does it mean to bring something um, like a play into a devastated landscape like New Orleans in such a way that not only becomes aesthetically interesting, but locally sustainable? I've known Creative Times work uh, for a long time, living in New York City. It was through my experience with working with them that um, I decided perhaps that this would be a perfect project for them to partner with me on. When you deal in a place that's been so devastated as the site right. around us, Lower Ninth Ward, where people have lost family and generations are wiped out and the trauma is so vast, you can't just have an art idea and think you're going to do it. You really got to make sure it's even a good idea at all. So we set up a ton of interviews with people in the community just to talk to people and ask them if they knew people we should talk to. And we basically just said, is this a good idea? What are your reactions? And I think people had positive, but also mixed reactions. I think people were skeptical. A lot of people said, you know, a lot of people come down here with a lot of promises. Well, like any community, and uh, if you have been through two years of promises of people saying he's going to do something, they want to help you, you back off and you investigate to make sure. Mm -hmm. Just meeting Paul, I saw his concern. Uh, it wasn't just a hit and miss come in here, uh, get some notoriety and then ride off on your horse and say, yippee, we did this for this for these people who were hurting. But I saw a deeper involvement. How y'all doing? Give me your name. Okay, and building an Albert Clark. How you doing, Mr. and Mrs. Clark? Fine. Okay. My mom's house is right there. Uh, that's that's where I see. I, I've seen. And also, our uh -huh. home is right there on the corner of the Yellow House of Tennessee. Okay. Yes. Okay. Our home as well. 
we had to talk to the people who actually lived in the sites. This is certainly the way that I um, came to work with and admire Robert Green, who lives in a FEMA trailer on Tennessee Street, uh, half a block away from the, from the play location. I've, I've been named the ambassador of the night war. I grew up playing football in the streets here. My children played football in the streets here. My grandkids and I used to walk the street every day speaking to my elderly neighbors. And most of my neighbors want to come back. Most of my neighbors are struggling to come back. And basically, that's why I'm here. I love when people tell me this was the first ever year Blacks were allowed to own property. I have a habit of always inviting people into my house. And Paul Chan came one afternoon. He gave me uh, the Creative Time brochure that he did. And I read the whole brochure. And after reading it, I gave Paul a call back. I said, let's not waste time with idle discourse. Meaning, why waste our time talking about what you want to do? Just tell me what I can do to help you. We didn't want to have somebody coming all the way from New York to do some good for us and two people show up. <laughs> Me and Paul just started going together to different places. We went around to the churches. We went to Martin Luther King School. We went to a uh, Close Cuts Barber Shop. We went to uh, Mickey B's Bar. We had a potluck dinner at uh, Ronald Lewis's house. When we were at the potluck dinner, they had so many people that I knew that this would be a good production. Uh, it would be a good turnout. It would be well supported because there were so many different aggregations of people, different people from all walks of life there. After reading Waiting for Godot, it's... Here, I'm just going to show you some of the um, footage of the actual performance, too. As we'll march the gumbo seating happy people two blocks down the street, and then the people filter in to the seating, at which point everyone sits down and the plate moves. Oh, oh my God! Is it At last, reinforcements at last! Oh. Is it We were beginning to weaken, and now we're sure to see the evening out. <laughs> oh, do you hear him? All evening we have struggled unassisted. Oh, we are no longer alone, waiting for the night, waiting for Godot, waiting for waiting. All evening we struggled unassisted, and now. It's already tomorrow. Ah! Time flows again already. The sun will set. Okay. Um, so what I want to talk about with that is to, um, a few things. So this play is very famous and old. And we, you know, the artist, Paul Chan, didn't do anything new. The play was written by Samuel Beckett. Um, it's a really simple production. We brought in a theater company called um, the Harlem Theater Company, who actually produced the play. So what did Paul Chan do? Well, Paul said um, something that's very interesting. He said, the play comes in two parts, the production of a play and the production of a public. The first part sets up the second, the second part sets up the first. And when he says the production of a public and the production of a play, I think about this as the root of what this lecture is about. The production of a play could be considered the production of art or the production of aesthetics. The production of public is the production of the environment in which the art happens, the set of social relationships that come to encounter that art. So in order to do this play, like you saw in the video, Paul Chan and Robert Greene went around and basically talked to people for five months. And they just did interviews with people and got to know them and they held potlucks and all this stuff. And why do that? Why? You can just do the play. By the time the play happened, there was a whole different set of relationships across race, class, people kind of coming together so that there was a very different way in which the art could take place. And let's think of the production of a public as an infrastructure, a set of human relationships that allows art to happen. Think of it like the stage or think of it like the museum. When you put on art, it doesn't just go happen anywhere. If it happens inside a museum, it's just, it's happening inside a vast set of social relationships from the board of the museum to the director, to all kinds of things that set up the place in which you actually encounter the art. And why is that important? Well, because you as a visitor don't just see the art. You also had to walk up to the building. You have to pay the ticket. 
You have to go inside. You have to under, you see all this, you see all the grandeur. You are personally aware of where you're seeing the art as much as you are aware of the art itself, which is to say the infrastructure that gives the space for you to encounter art is part of the art. Make sense? Okay, this is the point. And so the production of a public is what's interesting about that is rather than thinking of infrastructure as something that always happens in the world and you just have to like accept it, infrastructure or the public or the set of social relationships that allow us to encounter art can also be constructed, can also be intentionally considered. All right. I'm going to also show you some art projects that are a little more fun because I want, because I can't, you can't do an art lecture without showing art. That's just part of the rule. Okay. So, okay. Yeah. So we're going to go to this other project. Oh, it, it. So um, I also did a project with this artist, Paul Ramirez Jonas. This is just some fun so you can get a sense of some other art projects I did. It's called Key to the City. Many cities in the world have what's called a key to the city. It's typically a symbolic key that is awarded to somebody that's done something amazing, like a sports star, a musician or something. Um, and then they'll get the key to the city. And of course, the key to the city typically refers to the Roman period era where there literally were walled cities. And there was, I don't even know if there actually was a key to the front gates of Rome, but there was a gate. And the idea is that the key unlocks your access to the city. So this artist, Paul Ramirez, Joan has worked on a project where we actually would make a key to the city and in fact, this was adopted by the city of New York for one month by Mayor Bloomberg. But the key wasn't just a symbol, it also functionally opened up places all over the city. So it's a sculpture that you can use. We distributed 26,000 of these keys. And what you would do is you would go, <laughs> this is Times Square. <laughs> you would go to Times Square and you would, you know, like your daughter or somebody, you'd have to award someone the key and you'd sign this agreement, it was very official. And you would give them to, you know, you give somebody the key for like getting straight A's or washing the dishes or something. Here you go, I give you a key. You get, they give you a key. You get your key. And then you see in their hands, they got this little passport. So it would show you 26 different sites that your key actually would open. 26, 26 locks that your key would open. So here, you could go to Queens. Uh, it's a borough of New York. And you, there was a back door to a taqueria and your key would open the back door and you could go down the steps and you'd be in the back of the kitchen and you could make tortillas with the staff if you open that door. How cool is that? Here is a light that was in Bryant Park. You could put your key in the light and turn it on or off. Fun. Here's the Brooklyn Museum. Your key would open a secret door between two paintings and there was an art show on just for you. How cool is that? All right. Pretty cool, right? So the key to the city was also a way to show what was public or private in the city with a functional key. And it ranged in, um, the sites ranged from highly powerful, like we actually had the mayor's house. One of the rooms in the mayor's house could be opened with a key to stuff that's much more working class, like the taqueria. Um, we had uh, the, the walkway between New Jersey and New, in New York City. <laughs> you could open the key and walk across. So it was this really cool thing, and it was a it was a kind of project around access and support. All right. Now, I'll tell you about another project. This is a project I did called Funk God Jazz and Medicine, Black Radical Brooklyn. And this is back to the theme of infrastructure, my main theme for this talk. Um, I'll say this, which is I was really, I'm really interested in the idea that the money that goes into something reflects the politics of the thing it's trying to discuss. So that it's not just art that points at a thing, it, it's an art that is the thing. So that the budget for a show also reflects the politics of the show. Certainly we're all familiar with giant exhibitions where they you know, spend giant amounts of money and the art is very political, but the budget just goes to like nothing interesting at all, just pop business as usual, okay? So this show was an interesting project around black self-determination in Brooklyn, taking place in this place called uh, Weeksville. This is, a, the play, this is our cultural partner for this exhibition that took place in 2014. By the way, 
you know, just, just in case you're wondering, this is actually the, my favorite show I ever worked on. It is also probably the show the fewest people saw. I <laughs> think like 2,000 people saw it or something. Um, it's okay. Um, but this is the idea. So this place, here you see these kind of historic homes. Well, Weeksville um, was an area in Brooklyn um, that was lost to time. But in the early 19th century, it was a place that free blacks could own property, started by a guy named James Weeks. And James Weeks was a free black who understood that in New York State, if you were a free black American that um, and male and owned property, you could vote. And so he started to get his friends and various others to buy property in the area. And they began to... Um, collectively own um, land. And this place that they formed was called Weeksville. And Weeksville was a free black community that had its own churches, had its own schools, had its own um, medical facilities, had its own intentional infrastructure. Okay, this, you getting me? Infrastructure. But it was literally like an intentional place to live. And what's amazing about it was it was, at some point it was lost to time. And then in 1968, uh, a graduate professor at CUNY grad school um, in anthropology had read about Weeksville and was wondering if there was any places left that looked like it. And so they rented a prop plane and they flew over Brooklyn to see if they could find any remnants of Weeksville. And sure enough, they found these three homes that you're looking at right here that were literally diagonal on the grid of Brooklyn and they went down and they were like, oh my gosh, these are some of the original homes from that. And so in 1968, a very political year in the United States, um, the community in bed all rallied to make it a historic house museum. Fast forward to 2014, and the curators of this house museum had begun a kind of artistic program where the arts kind of reflected this dream of Weeksville. That is to say, not only was it about performing arts and performance, dance, there was also like a, um, a garden, so they were growing their own food. But the whole art experience at Weeksville um, was an integration of infrastructure, an intentional black infrastructure, and the arts. And so when we partnered with um, Weeksville, we decided to make an exhibition that would partner with organizations of black self-determination and artists so that the money that we spent on the show would then go towards black cultural organizations so that we would support the infrastructure of the neighborhood, if that makes any sense. Rach, I'm in a lecture. Sorry, I'm oh, sorry. I'm sorry. Um, so then um, this is um, Zenobia Bailey. She's an artist and we partnered her with the Boys and Girls High School of New York. And Boys and Girls High School was a local high school that really did a lot to support their um, uh, the, the kids. It was like a failing school, but it's a massive infrastructure of education in the neighborhood. And then um, we partnered with this guy, Bradford Young, an artist, a filmmaker. He actually, um, he's a black cinematographer that was up for Academy Awards for his film, his work on the movie Arrival. Um, he worked with the uh, Bethel Tabernacle AME Church um, which was the first um, black Episcopal church in New York State um, with the black congregation. He did a film in their church of all the congregation members. So this is a kind of art artistic interpretation of the community there. We worked with uh, this group from Houston called Otabanga Jones and Associates, and they worked with the Brooklyn Jazz Consortium to produce this <laughs> the sod in half Cadillac that's pink that became a mobile radio station where they did out in public kind of radio broadcasts that were all about the kind of issues in the neighborhood and the politics going on at the time. And finally, um, we worked with the artist Simone Lee on a pr project called um, the P Free People's Medical Clinic. It took place uh, in this uh, house called the Stuyvesant Mansion that was established by a woman named Josephine English who was uh, the first black OBGYN in New York State. She was really interested in black self-determination and she was interested in historic um, wellness for the black community. And so this house was really dedicated to kind of a infrastructure of health. 
And so when Simone Lee did this project with them, she was interested in a 21st century idea of what black health and wellness could be. And so I'm going to show you a video of what that project was like. Oh, wait, wait, hold on. Hold on. There we go. So we're standing in the home of Dr. Josephine English. Uh, she was the first African American OBGYN uh, to have her own practice in New York. This is her home, it's owned by her family still. And it has had many incarnations since she lived here. She it has been a community center, a senior center, um, and now the Free People's Hospital Clinic. All right, that's enough of that. Um, so let me just go through a few. Hold on, let me just, yeah, I'm going to stop sharing. Okay, so let me just say a few things about that. So that project um, really tried to think of the infrastructure of healthcare as something to tackle. And what was interesting about it was, as you could see, like they had preventative medicine, so they had like yoga classes, they had um, kind of workshops on community health. They also had like real, like actual like doctors there that were doing screenings and testings for like breast cancer or HIV awareness. But it was a health clinic and it was locally based. And what was fascinating about it was that it hit this community need so deeply that it became really, really, really popular and people just kept coming. And it was just kind of, it was inspired, you know, the title is Free People's Medical Clinic, which was inspired by the Black Panthers of the late 60s, early 70s, who really were interested in not just black self-determination, but black owned businesses, black owned schools, just like Weeksville. Um, the reason I think that, and that's kind of almost anarchist in spirit, but it's an important precedent because it is a kind of example where art meets life, right? Where they actually built their own structures. And so when, when um, Simone Lee did this project, I mean, for the record, it was still an art show. And for as much as I wanted these budgets to go, it's a big, it's a, it's a big ask to make your own healthcare system. I got that. I understand that. But that said, that said, by hitting the real needs of people and anybody in any community, you want real needs, jobs, health, education, you know, basics, those are infrastructure. And when you start tackling those needs, people become extremely awake. Mm -hmm. Suddenly they're aware of you. And certainly these things, these infrastructures, allow people to operate in the world differently. And so while Simone Lee's infrastructure was temporary, it showed a profound gap between what people needed and what was actually happening in their communities. Hospitals, at least in the, many places in the world, hospitals are not friendly places you actually almost feel like you're gonna get sick by going in there. 
they certainly could use some art. If you looked at the look of Simone Lee's, it almost looked like from outer space nurses that are from past and the future. They had a DJ playing this weird music, but it was like a really beautiful place, you know? And it was this place that people felt comfortable in. It was run by people that looked like them. So that project, I just want to say that project was really profoundly moving for me. And also I, I say that the, the experiment we had, which is four commissions where the organ, where the budgets would go to people and organizations that lived the politics we were talking about, if that makes sense to you. And certainly I think that is an example of an art, an art experiment where the infrastructure was part of the art itself. Okay. Art projects explain them. Um, now, a few other things to say. In the art world, I'll say this about infrastructure too. The funny thing about the word art is that it means very different things to very different people. But generally the way we know what art is, is the ways that we have encountered it in our lives. Perhaps you've experienced art at a gallery a lot, or perhaps you've seen it in museums. But wherever you've seen art, it's come by way of a certain infrastructure. You have had to encounter it in one way or another. And I say that because um, our idea of what art is, is shaped by the infrastructures of the world we are in. So let's just as a simple experiment, talk about how we often, what is the infrastructure of the arts? How do we experience it? Well, some of us experience it through schools. So there is there is an infrastructure of art education, whether it's undergraduate, high school, college, postgrad, art schools, there's a system there. And there's ways that those things pay the bills. <laughs> there's ways there is an economy behind these things, okay? Just kind of, I'm being very simple. There's also commercial galleries. And the commercial galleries, you know, they put the art on the wall, they have the labels, they got somebody that sells it to people that have a lot of money, and that makes that happen. There's a reason it exists, right? And basically, okay, so there's galleries, there's museums. Museums come into the world for some reason. Typically, uh, the collecting institutions, somebody owns a lot of stuff, and they need to show it off. And there's very wealthy people that make it run, and they show these very important works, and, that's, and then people pay tickets to go see it, okay? All right. Then they're like, now we live in the internet age, so there's also like websites and stuff like this. Okay, why am I saying this? It's useful for you to track how you've encountered art in your life because it'll sh it will spell a very specific idea of what art is to you. And I say all this because there's so much art I like that doesn't fit in anything I just described, right? That there are ways that art can exist that doesn't fit any of those infrastructures. And so the problem of that is if there's a kind of art that is much more robust, that dares to dream bigger, and it doesn't fit in any of these things, the problem it encounters is how do any of us experience it? How do we even know that's possible? We only know what we experience, right? Most people I know that are into art actually think it's just like a gallery. Like I think of art as the, like what is the craziest, like art to me is total freedom. You know, like, how can we build this crazy world? And then you meet artists and they're like, how do I put the art on the wall and the label and wine o'clock at five on a Friday? And that's the formula for art. I'm like, oh, I'm so bored. I can't. I'm like, oh, what? Is that what we wanted out of art? That boring? No. Like we wanted dreams, big, go, go, right? Freedom. I mean, how is it that art, the most radical thinking, has the most boring formula? How did that happen? I don't know. Infrastructure. Okay. So it's important if you want to build a different art world, you have to build a different art infrastructure. So for example, what Irfan and y'all doing with this Tehran summit, like the goal is to introduce other practices to each other, right? Okay. And that in doing that, we're actually able, oh, can I stop shaking head? Me? Oh, no, you. <laughs> Yeah. Oh, me. I was like, me? Am I rich? It's all good. Um, anyways, so then like um I was thinking like, so that's one part is like the way you encounter art is the way that you understand what's possible with art. If you want to change what collective ideas of art, then you have to change the way people encounter art. Okay, that's part one. Let me talk about legitimation. 
Um, this is the most important point. So when you um, understand what's possible in the world, we know things exist because other people say they exist. This is what legitimation does. So for example, there's some simple things. And I'll give you an example. When I was a curator at Mass MoCo, it's a museum in Massachusetts, and I would do these shows of political art. And when I did these shows and showed artists that I liked making this art, suddenly, because those artists showed in the museum, they were more likely to get jobs. Why? Because suddenly the museum said it was important, whatever they were doing, right? Think of it like a resume, right? Like the institution goes, we'll call that legitimation. It legitimates a practice, right? And why is that important? Well, first of all, is to say two things about legitimation. One is when you get legitimated, not only are you able to get more things from your career or whatever, but it also furthermore tells you that what you're doing is good, okay? But legitimation doesn't have to just come from a museum. Legitimation is the ways that we believe that things are okay to do. So to go back to what Tehran Summit can do, not only does Le Tehran Summit introduce people to new art ideas, it simultaneously legitimates these ideas, right? It says these are approved ideas. And we as humans think we actually understand the world by what is legitimated by the world. That we, as, and also, let's just say, put another perspective on legitimation. Have you ever made an artwork and then somebody wrote about it in a magazine or a zine or online and suddenly you saw yourself in print somewhere and you thought to yourself, oh, oh, wait, hold on. Oh, my calendar just chipped. And then you thought to yourself, oh, my God, I exist. Like your own art got legitimated by someone. Make sense to me, you? You ever had your art legitimated by an outside entity and it felt so good? Like you just thought, oh, thank God, somebody legitimated me. Well, why do I say that? Because not only is legitimation something for a career or whatever, it affects us personally. It affects us how we understand ourselves. So not only can museums legitimate, but our friend group can legitimate us, right? This is what I was talking about with the friend. A community is an infrastructure. And the community that you operate in can actually legitimate your sense of self. Why is that important? Well, the more radical your sense of self is, the more you're not gonna get it from a museum and the more you're not gonna get it from a gallery. And if you depend on your sense of legitimation from the world of power, then, the only way you're going to get it is if you play the game of power. But if you want to do a radical sense of art or, or even being, whether it's different sexualities, whether it's different sense of how you're making art, whatever, the only way to do that is to build your own infrastructure that legitimates you through your friends, through your family. Does that make sense? It's very important because I feel like um, the best art, like I said at the very beginning, comes from people feeling confident enough to speak their private truths. And the only way that happens is through legitimation. All right. Ah. All right, the next point I want to talk about is money. Now, I'm a Marxist, but I'm also, for the record, that needs massive qualification. Uh, because, you know, I mean, Marxist, if you really read it, was obsessed with capitalism. And he was in, he analyzed how capital worked. Um, as I get older, um, I've come to realize one basic thing of Marxism that I was my own naive version of it, which is I just avoided money my entire life. <laughs> I mean, at some point in my life, that became a problem. Um, but basically, I pointed at everything that actually used money as capitalist. But I've come to realize you can't build a world without taking money seriously. An infrastructure, like I said, needs money to survive. A lot of art I like in my earlier years required no money, and it was all built on the energy of 20-year-olds. But as I get older, I realize that revolutions can't just survive on the energy of 20-year-olds, because at some point, people have kids, people get sick, people need jobs, 
they need to take their life seriously, and you need to build an infrastructure that actually takes seriously the economy that perpetuates it. Many infrastructures that legitimate, whether it's a museum, a commercial gallery, an online magazine, at some point in time, the only reason they exist is that somehow they keep paying the bills. And the, <laughs> it's so funny, but the world that we see with our eyes somehow exists because the bills get paid. The world we walk through, the world we try to stumble through, the art world, the, a lot of the existing infrastructures have an economy that got solved somehow. And why do I say that? Because if you make an anti-capitalist economy, it will come and go very fast if it doesn't take money seriously. I think you can still have an anti-capitalist economy that takes an economy seriously, but it's something important to do, which is money isn't necessarily a commodity. Money can also be a part of resource sharing to build su sustainability, if this makes sense. And I bring this up now because I really believe that radical arts infrastructure has to find an economy that allows it to sustain itself. You ever worked with some people for a while and suddenly people want to get paid and it's a problem because <laughs> there's no money there. Now that said, I want to just be very qualified about that. I'm sure the budget on the Tehran summit's like negligible and like many awesome things, like they don't need money to survive. It's all goodwill. I totally for that. I'm 100% for it. In fact, I think it's essential. I just think, you know, radical artists sometimes don't want to take money seriously, but then they leave that powerful tool to capitalists and all the people that actually shape the world. And you want to shape the world, you got to have some money. Um, and so I think it's a, it's a revolutionary tool that can be intentionally used to do good things. I really do. I think it's like an important part of the toolkit of infrastructure uh, to make this. For example, the Simone Lee project I worked on, I mean, it lasted two weeks. And why did it stop? Do you know why it stopped? There's no money left. <laughs> it's, I mean, how many art projects don't, don't keep going because there's no money? But it's also, that wasn't the point of that project. I understand that. But I actually feel like there are people that be willing to pay money for an alternative healthcare system. There is a way you could shape that in an interesting way. And, you know, honestly, the Black Panthers took money seriously. They were interested in alternative economies. They were interested in this kind of question. And so, I think it's important because honestly, the idea of art is often shaped by things that are around. And how do things last? Somehow they're able to sustain themselves. Whether it's a gallery, it's an online magazine, whether it's a higher education school, that part of the formula is important. Now, I'll be sympathetic to all you artists because of course, I'm like you, which is most people are artists because they don't want a career. And then they wonder 20 years later, why don't I have a career? And you're like, well, because you chose the field that doesn't want a career. But nevertheless, it's it's kind of a funny thing to ask all of us because we're all romantic and bohemian and wild. But in the call for an alternative infrastructure, I think this is an important part of it, is trying to understand the financial piece of this. Um, finally, distribution and, and an opportunity. I um, actually came by way of here through DDEM. Hi, DDEM. And Didem was uh, an artist at this school I started called the Alternative Art School. And, you know, this just to put it out there, I kind of call myself now a cultural infrastructure builder um, because it is literally what I've chosen to do with the rest of my life is different, which is I've come to focus on just infrastructure. So I want, I'm building, you know, we have this online school and, the, you know, to talk about the money, the way it works is we charge United States rates to people in the West and we subsidize people from the global south and marginalized communities with that money, right? So it's an intentional economy. It has a, a tuition dollars that pay for it. But then we use the power of the internet to keep our costs down. Because of course, if I were to build a real university, like in the physical world, like get the bricks out and then get an HVAC system put in and get a security guard and get the desks in, the how much money is that? That's crazy. But you know, the school, it's its pretty simple. Like we Zoom, the cost of getting up, it up and going is a website, some communication, the costs are very cheap. And so we could build infrastructure in here at a price that is not crazy to do. 
And the other thing I will also say that's interesting about the schools and infrastructure and what's happening here at the Tehran summit, I do believe the internet is profoundly powerful and that, you know, um, us talking to each other and legitimating other ideas of what it means to be a person on this planet, to be against, to be basically reasonable, interested in environmental sustainability, interested in justice for people, interested in actually being able to have rights in our lives, interested in not being a colonialist project. You know, these, I think, basic ideas that are very much understood in the arts can be legitimated and perpetuated and built on globally in a way through here that doesn't require us all getting on an airplane to see each other. I think it's a profound tool for internationalism and I don't um, underestimate what it can do. And it's also important to recognize in the most basic way, this is an experiment that has never happened in the globe ever of what we're doing right now. This has never happened. And we have an ability to think ideas together that run counter to the dominant systems that are at play. That basic thing, which is we can build our own infrastructure together. We can support each other. We can actually think together. And in so doing, we will make different kinds of art together. We will shape each other. We will change with each other. We will make a, a world worth inhabiting together. And while you can, we can always be cynical, there's all kinds of complications and problems. I get it. But I want to be, I've always kind of, I, you know, I'm a glass half full kind of guy. I like the idea that things are possible in the world. You know, I know there's always problems, but um, there's a lot of, a lot of people with lots of power are very dumb. They just know how to get power. Um, so I think it's like, you don't have to overthink it. We just got to build together. I'm going to end on that note, which is let's build a world worth inhabiting together through infrastructure and art. And I'm happy to answer any questions. And thanks so much. Amazing. Thank you so much, Nato. <laughs> Thanks. It was great. Uh, if anybody has any questions, you can raise hand. All right. Gazelle, go ahead. Uh, hello. Do you see hi, me? Gazelle. Hear me? Yeah. Yes, hi. Uh, thank you. Um, I had a question. I don't know if I did, didn't get it right or... You didn't say anything about it for the first project, you know, the waiting for Godot and yeah. New Orleans. Okay. So, I mean, it was a spectacular environment. It was a natural catastrophe. It was an incredible set design for the audience who paid to see the, uh, the piece. Oh, it's what happened to the locals? I mean, were the locals there and did they have to pay to watch? And what did it do to the local economy, actually, that uh, the fact that you did that piece there at that time? Sure, thanks for the question. Absolutely important. So yeah, that's essential to answer. The answer to that is essential to the project. So the project was, it was free. There was no tickets. And it was almost entirely the local community. Um, we'd done six months of community organizing in advance of the project. And like I was saying, um, the who was in the audience was almost more important than the play itself. It was literally about supporting that. I didn't mention this too, but the budget for the play, uh, the production also, uh, we made the same budget that was distributed to local organizations. So half a million dollars went out to local um, nonprofits in the area as well as, so that was what we call the shadow budget of the project. Um, that said, I don't wanna overestimate the, the scale of what we were up against in terms of um, the economy. I mean, the, that gesture, I think it helped on a on a kind of civic pride level, a community level, but it wasn't that there's nothing that our project could do in the face of that <laughs> hurricane itself. And like the mass devastation that um, white supremacist uh, structural racism had done to that neighborhood. I mean, that said, I will say one other part of this because it's hard to know, you know, I mean, um, I would say that in the after uh, waiting for Godot in New Orleans, then a biennial showed up a year and a half later called Prospect that has since um, been happening in the neighborhoods since every two years, depending. And, and there was a big kind of resurgence in the arts in that area. So I think it did some things on that front. And certainly there was a deep awareness around the kind of racial divides that uh, stratified the community previously. So there's something there. 
Thank you. So you mean the local local people who were devastated by the catastrophe actually went and saw the piece? So even that yeah. is already great. Yeah. Well, not only that. I mean, not only that. I mean, in the video, you saw this guy, Robert Green, who was, you know, he lost his mother and his granddaughter during the flood, and he became our ambassador of one of many. And he really, like, um, I mean, that that kind of community organizing is was essential to the project, right? And he, and and also, too, I think, like, when people talk about community, um, <laughs> a lot of communities don't like each other. Um, and there's a lot of ill will and, and complexity, and it's not like everybody, the neighborhood just shows up as one group. It's different groups that have different factions. So it took a lot of work to get people to show up. Um, and that's the that was the work that was the project in and of itself. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, NATO. Uh, I had two questions. I think you answered one of them uh, after this lecture. I was wondering, what would an artist do, uh, like living in a totalitarian country where you have commercial galleries and museums? that don't want their power and authority to be challenged and do everything to sort of, I don't know, oppress you. On the other hand, you have, you're dealing with the government. You can't go outside. You cannot make um, any sort of like art projects that you want because, you know, you need permission and they're not going to give it to you. So in that case, what an artist can do, and I think the answer is, build your own infrastructures, infrastructures and uh, things that can legitimate your the, the way you want to create an artwork, right? I don't have an easy answer. I mean, certainly you probably can answer better than I can, Irfan. But certainly, I will say this, for whatever reason, I shouldn't even laugh, but some of the best art movements have come from, to, of, of, from artists under totalitarian systems. Yeah. Um, certainly, uh, Eastern Europe under the... Um, uh, uh, when they were under the Russian control or the Soviet Union during the, you know, the, the, the early 20th century, or like, uh, I mean, the mid, late 20th century. Um, there was all this kind of interesting Samizdat movement, al alternative forms of communication, lots of mail art to get around the kind of control systems. I yeah. think of also like uh, artists currently and, and have been in Havana or in Cuba. There's a lot of interesting art that's made there, but I do think... Um, I'm about to say something very obvious, but kind of interesting, which is I do think this internet is a huge tool. Definitely. Um, and I don't know the ways around it. And maybe you should answer it more than I. I don't know. But I would say um, sometimes resistance builds community faster. Um, it, you know, people feel like they're in something together. They tend to bond more. Yeah. And um, that is a powerful tool in terms of building an art form. Um, I, I don't. I don't want to profess to know much though because I haven't had the same kind of structures put on me. I mean, there's different ones. I don't want to make it light of it, but certainly there's a lot of privilege from the position I'm coming from. Yeah, and is build your own infrastructure is a way, is a translation of Marx saying seize the means of production. Yeah, I think so. Although I think, um, I mean, there is that. I mean. I mean, I think it's a really simple Marxist argument, which is the world that makes the, the external world actually makes who you are. So in many ways, the means of production are how you think. But at the same time, I don't want to be so dumb as to pretend it's easy for people to simply do that. Like, are you going to take over your job? Um, so I think you kind of have to be tactical about it. You're going to have to be careful about what what production you can make. Um, you know, I think it's okay for people to make their living in things that aren't necessarily radical. Um, I, you know, I also think it's important that people are able to pay their bills in their life and take care of people they care about. And that a truly radical idea of art and life needs to be sympathetic to people's lives that are trying to figure that out. Yeah, definitely. Um, I would love to have uh, other people asking questions. Um, so there is this, there was this uh, very interesting controversy sort of in Iran going on during the revolution of uh, woman life freedom uh, between um, the art goers, art gallery goers and art galleries, commercial galleries. And it was a question of whether or not they should open. 
during such a uh, crisis. And um, I want to know your what would be your answer. And my uh, the other question is that when the artist's job is to create the crisis, challenge the reality, in order to make the audience, make their audience, uh, be aware of the, what is going on, uh, cre create challenges against that which is in favor of that which is not or that which is possible. If is that that's the case in in the in the time of revolution when it's actually happening, it's it's a protest against that which is. To go back to the statement that I wrote for the summit, what's the role of artists during revolutions? I'll tell you something. I think I, I, I have a strong belief in something so simple, which is I think artists should always be allowed to make and show art no matter what the situation. And I say that because I've, I've lived through too many radical moments where the activists then tell us, this is not the time for art. This is the time for true revolution. And I sometimes I'm tired of hearing it because I always think there's always great time for art. And that also the arts are um, a way of thinking differently about the world that demonstrate a set of values that I think are very important. I'm very leery of cultural boycotts. I'm very leery of things that tell artists to not make art. I think that art has, and I don't want to be so simple, art's a very complicated term and there's many kinds of art. But in general, I think people thinking differently about the world in a way that's creative and expresses themselves is always important. And I'm always suspect of anybody that tells you now is not the time for that. Because it sounds exactly like the words of people I do not like all the time. And you know, and I've also felt, <laughs> I mean, and this is sympathetic to revolutionary moments or just everyday life, which is if you don't express the world you want to live in all the time, you will forget what world you want to live in. Um, and I think there's, you know, I feel like sometimes activist culture can sometimes forget. They can be very um, literal about the world. It can be very strictly defined. So, and I think like it's important to be open to this. And the other thing I was going to say about revolution and activist moments is only that um, <laughs> the world is more surreal than people want to admit, which is, I almost think like activism is almost just as symbolic as art anyways. And so, but the activists pretend they're being very utilitarian and the artists are very uh, uh, ambiguous. But sometimes I think activism is actually very ambiguous, but thinks it's utilitarian. Um, the road is very long. And I think like you've got to read the culture you want to inhabit all the time. So that's where I'm at these days. I used to sign petitions and like really participate in boycotts and this and this and this. And over the years, I feel like it's the, the, the instinct to say, don't make art. I've stopped believing in this is me now. I've actually feel like always make art all the time while you make revolution. This is my feeling these days. I just, that's how I am. But what type of art are we speaking about? Like, oh, sure. Because, yeah, you know, because uh, at the same time, you had the regime actually uh, promoting, like opening up all uh, cultural institutions, like yeah. museums, like uh, music concerts and everything to, to make people think that nothing has happened and normalize the situation, you know? Yeah. Well, I mean, let me say this, first of all. I think there's ways to challenge. Um, I mean, the, the, what am I going to say? Like, does does opening a museum actually like normalize things? I mean, if the streets are full of, I just well, it's a question. I mean, it, it, it's there's some things that can happen. For example, I mean, I, I don't want to be so straightforward about it. You know, in the United States, you had someone like Nan Golden, who um, went after the Sacklers, who were the family that founded this pharmaceutical company called Purdue Pharma, and they were the creators of a drug called Oxycontin. And the Sackler family was on every museum wall in the world almost. And so Nan Golden went right after them for the jugular and attacked them and would like have protests and shut down museums. And that, um, her war on the Sacklers worked. Like they're no longer on any, hardly any museum walls anymore. And the, the Sacklers were actually sued for hundreds of millions of dollars. 
Um, why do I say that? I, I was saying that I don't want to say like simply like it's okay all the time. Museums should just stay open. You have to pick your moments. So you're right. And it's also like there's many kinds of art. Like there's art institutions and then there's like private galleries. You know what I mean? Like there's different kinds of infrastructures that are out there. And certainly also some some organ some countries are much more state sponsored where the voice of the state translates directly towards its institution. So they literally become a almost PR arm of the state. That's a very different infrastructure than one in the United States where it's actually like not state sponsored heavily, right? It's much more informal with the money class running them. So, you know, I hate to be, you know, now I'm sort of taking back what I said a little bit in so much as you got to be somewhat strategic about the ways in which you're dealing with it. I mean, if art is simply a PR arm for the state, then that's a very different kind of art institution, obviously, especially when you're fighting, a, when you're actually resisting that very force. I mean, then it really, and it's a very direct connection too, you know? Yeah, definitely. Um, no, I mean, I think you know the answer to that and it is case by case. I, I'm just kind of like a little reluctant to be like, sometimes with, with revolutionary moments, people are like, now is not the time for art. Now is the time for revolution. And I have to just push back on that a lot because I've heard that so many times in my life. Yeah. Um, but that's more the artist, that. sorry, that's more the artist than it is the big institutions. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Like, Interesting. Other, do you have a question? Yes, I want to say that, um, well, of course, I also believe that artists should uh, should always make art and you always uh, have your inputs and you make art. But what we're facing now is that, um, um, well, I, do, I don't want to judge what's bad art or what's good art, but I can make, I can say that there's a lot, of, a lot of ridiculous art, meaning that there's a lot of ridiculous stuff happening in Iran, I'm in Paris now, I was, I was in Iran throughout the whole thing, uh, but now I'm in Paris, but here uh, in the States, everywhere, you see a lot of ridiculous art by Iranian artists, and a lot of them are using this revolution to promote themselves only, and it's so ridiculous most of the time that uh, next to the civil disobedience and everything else that's going on, you just say that, it's enough. I mean, just make your art. Don't necessarily show it. That's what I'm trying to say. You know, you know, you can't you can't stop anybody from making art. It's fantastic. But I would like to ask people who are just making art to promote themselves during this time, which is a lot. I've seen it a lot in, in Europe, in the US and in Iran. They should stop or even they, if they don't want to stop. I just want to say this fact that we have we're facing a lot of this right now. Um, a lot of uh, famous artists, I'm not going to name anybody, but a lot of famous artists have really abused of this, which is really horrible. And a lot of younger people are just doing ridiculous stuff just to, to make themselves known. And it's really sad because, uh, um, I mean, I know everybody wants to try to do something, but I think there should be an end to something ridiculous. And I don't want to say names, but there's so many names. If you just Google it, you'll find out a lot. Anyway. Let me ask you, though, I mean, let me ask you about that, because I think it's a slippery slope that I want to push back on. You know, this idea that people make art to just promote themselves in the age of social media. I mean, let's ask ourselves, how, is, how are you able to deduce? How are you? No, I'm not art? talking about the age of social media. I'm talking about the revolution that's taking place in Iran. There are a lot of people doing things only targeted to promote themselves. Well, being, I I understand that. Some are famous, that. some are yeah. less famous, and some are unknown. But the you. aim is to promote themselves. It's not to do something for the How situation. Do you know? How do you know? Because I know a lot of them. Yeah, but I mean, what I mean to say is- I've I been around like, for a long time. No, yeah. no, but I know that um, this accusation's been in everywhere I know in the world right now. Mm -hmm. And it, 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 it perpetuates no matter where, no matter what the situation. And I, I often wonder, um, how one's able to know what their intentions are. Um, and also simultaneously in the age of social media where these things, you know, you do have artists that become known for a thing regardless of whether, like there's just how that's arts known, right? Like I feel like if you depend on the major infrastructures for, ex for getting legitimation and then those infrastructures legitimate social capital through them, right? Known artists, 
wanting to get topical with revolution, like in the United States, for example, different story. Right now, black art is massive, right? Massive, major, major industry. Like Mark Bradford, Kerry James Marshall, Amy Sherrill, Kara Walker, huge money, huge money, right? And these artists, the Esther Gates, are very much accused by their contemporaries of just being into self-promotion and not using the money to actually do anything about um, white supremacy. But those artists say to them, what are you talking about? I'm just doing my art and it's not my fault that this work's gone successful. I only use that example because it's not your situation, but it is also a dynamic that's playing across the United States where the major institutions take a few figures to raise them up to represent a big social issue and then they get a lot of flack, but they also make a lot of money. So I feel like it's a part of the dynamic of these major infrastructures that happen regardless, you know? And so I'm wondering for us, because when we talk about alternative infrastructures, I feel like the only way you can deal with it is to like build your own infrastructures that legitimate things that are different values, rather than being angry with the existing infrastructures that will always perpetuate these kind of inequities of finance and social capital. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, that's a good point. I mean, yeah. I wonder, because I, it also can be very um, corrosive in um, art scenes. I find a lot of artists I know that are activists actually end up spending more time about the artists they hate that are famous than the ones they love. And and it, I find it to be, um, and I understand it. I totally get it. I just, it's um, it's not, I guess what I'm trying to say is it's it's not an easy thing to solve for. Um. Because I don't know, you know, like, what, let me ask you, Gazelle, right? Yes. What do you, what do you think, what's your um, feeling about how to counter that energy or like how to deal with it? Because it, it can be very frustrating, right? You know, it's, it's a bit different with what you're talking about with the U.S. and the black artists. Um, and we're talking about these past few months in Iran, okay? But what's a bit horrible is like when you have a famous artist who just about one or two months after Mass Amini, Ma Amini got killed uses uh, the slogan um, woman life freedom on her work and sells it and does not hashtag Mass Amini and does not hashtag the, the, the phrase that was initially Kurdish that I think we Iranians also stole in a way. The Kurds are not very happy about that. Anyway, but th saying that she made that uh, woman life liberty her own work, you know, and sold it. So this is about, I mean, this is not, I know what you're talking about with, with uh, what's happening in the U.S. now, because I've seen it here with Arab artists and uh, black, uh, whatever, ex-colonies of uh, France and everything. That, that's been going on for years. But this specific time of uh, Iran and all these Iranians, especially in diaspora, who I know want to do something, but when it comes to the fact that they saw selling their work with by using a slogan that was belonged to the people, and not even mentioning the person who got killed, who you know made everything happen, you know you're just like, come on, please stop, stop this. And why? Because this person has very important commercial galleries behind her. Nobody can uh, say anything to her. The only thing that happened was that in Berlin, a lot of young artists were there, young people, a lot of people were there and stopped her from going there and actually promoting more her work. Well, you know, but, I mean, you know, I hear it's you. It's a little I, too much, you know what I mean? It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a very, uh, you know, unusual situation for us, you know, now. Well, I'm just being really candid. With, I'm just being candid with you. So another one that I was thinking of is like, so you know that group, um, Pussy Riot? So like Nadia from Pussy Riots like become like the you know like the anti-Russian kind of poster child, but she often takes slogans from the protests and now it's like Nadia from Pussy Riots at Sotheby's making a big statement and now Nadia from Pussy Riot is with Judy Chicago and Gagosian Gallery and it's like and I hear you but the, there's a but I'm a very mixed message which is I do believe Pussy Riot actually is legitimately concerned with the situation that's existing. I think there is a certain kind of convenience. Of political causes that happens that can be frustrated but at the same time i'm not sure i feel like i've seen this happen with every revolutionary movement and the kind of symbolic culture and industry of resistance that like i don't know how to stop those forces from ever happening like it seems like no matter what when there's a political cause or revolution i remember during occupy 
it happened all the time. And I felt like these solidarity things, particularly from famous artists, they felt a little shallow, but I wasn't sure how to deal with my emotional energy around it either. Like, it seems like it always happens. I mean, we can go on, but I'm, I'm just kind of curious because it, it is something that for me too, drives me crazy. You know what I mean? I feel you on that. I feel you. I also sometimes feel like, I don't, it seems to always happen. I don't know. There are always people there who find, grab the right moment, I guess. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And it's also like, I think they really are sympathetically like, um, I'm not I'm not naming names, well, I did name names there, but I think for some of them, they actually are sympathetic to the cause and stuff like this, but they're not exactly in the, they're not trained at the kind of grass of all the people that might be annoying. Do you know what I mean? It's like, they're kind of, not quite there, but they're trying their best. So I don't know. I don't know what to do. Um, Hannah says, I too think that when an artist benefits from some movement, especially financially, they have to give something, some sort of support back. I think that's what Reza means. Well, I mean, can I ask something? I mean, this is the other thing I'll say too, is we live in the age of culture where approach, you guys are in it and certainly social movements and on a vast scale become also vast commercial opportunities to perpetuate a variety of things. And this is the decentered social media landscape where inevitably you might be in something, but it won't take too long before you're watching the thing you started be sold back to you. Right. And that is a very alienating experience. Right. But it is also incumbent on all of us to be prepared emotionally politically for that because it can be very um it can be it can lead to cynicism and it can lead to a lack of solidarity because people feel like they feel I don't know, because they feel like it's a cheap like you know we, the, the symbols get more confused in the, uh, the 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 alliances if that makes any sense now uh, um uh, does anybody have any questions i think my problem with it is the literalization and commodification of the whole idea of like a revolution you know you you have iranians on the street uh, getting killed and shouting roman life freedom you have people outside of iran in the comfort zone saying roman life freedom like what are you adding you know what i'm saying like where is the metaphor like does this artwork going to stand the test of time like what are you doing I mean, this is just to put in the infrastructure conversation, if I may. I think it's also good to have safeguards. Like if you have a really tight art community that has art they like and you don't worry about what the big systems are doing. Like, if you know what I mean? Like if you're just like, I'm only interested in like this group and we're going to support each other. You might protect yourself from worrying about what the museums are doing and what the art world is saying. Because I think when you get frustrated by that stuff, it's gonna always be annoying you know what i mean like it's always going to be that way like you kind of have to prepare yourself mentally politically socially to keep your head down in a way you know or to or to get your sense of legit like i'm always like this as soon as you depend on the big museums to legitimate stuff that you care about even when you pretend you don't but you're still annoyed by who shows in them you're in for some real heartbreak in this life you know, like people will say, I don't care who's in art forum, but then maybe a friend of yours gets in art forum and suddenly you're like jealous or something. Like, just don't be jealous. Just don't care. You know what I mean? Like you got to kind of protect your psychological space because this repackaging of your social movements is going to happen. And it can make you really frustrated people, but is that where you want to put your energies? No. You can't, it'll drive you nuts. It's too much. You're already yeah. awesome. Just stay awesome. Stay awesome. Yeah, exactly. Um, that's why we came up with the idea of like the Terra Summit. These things we are talking about, you cannot yeah. say it outside of this community, right. right? And that's the whole point of creating your community and uh, infrastructure. Yeah, and so also your own sense of values, because I think like too, it's definitely. like, one other thing I'll say is sometimes with, with small art scenes, you'll get one person of your group that becomes, that gets a lot of recognition. And I've seen groups where nobody gets recognition all like each other until one of them gets recognition. And then everyone gets jealous and they feel like they took advantage of the group work. You know what I mean? 
like these things can happen. So I think like, um, I don't know, it's like, it's, it's, it's real, you know? And also too, there are some people that are very good at turning a career out of social movements. Um, and with the artists in this realm of political art, it can be de de delicate. Yeah, definitely. Um, does anybody have any questions? If not, uh, I can wrap up the session with this great outro. I asked actually ChatGPT to write a rap song about Nato Thompson, and I'm gonna read the outro of it, which is amazing. Okay. It says, it hey, says Nato Thompson, a name that will resonate, inspiring generations, opening the gate with creativity as his weapon. He will always fight. An art revolution shining the light. That's dope, man. That's Check dope. The PT. That's dope. <laughs> it's dope. Wanna hear this song, man? <laughs> well, that's a good outro, bro. I'm yeah, totally down with that. It was great. Yeah. All right. <laughs> Thank you so much, man. Thanks, everybody. Thanks Pleasure for doing this. We really appreciate you. Bye, Thank you so much. Bye, bye.